O oh God, our Heavenly Father, you made everything that is. And we praise you that you can not only make anything from nothing, you can change the things that you have made. You have changed water into wine. You can change the desert and make it blossom like a rose. And we would thank you this morning for the change you have made in our own life. We would thank you for turning duties into delights. What a lovely change this has been. Father, it is our duty to be here. It is meet, right, and our bounden duty that we should at all times and in all places give thanks unto you. But it is a delight to come. We thank you that you have made praise an enjoyable thing in our hearts. We owe you our life but it is a joy to give it to you. Father, we thank you that you can change sorrows into joy, that you are the God who comforts the downcast. And if anyone has come to this service downcast, a bit depressed, overburdened or anxious about many things, we pray that you will lift them up and change their sorrow into joy. We thank you that you can take tiredness and turn it into boundless energy in your service. We know that even young people can faint and grow weary. We pray that you'll renew our strength as we wait upon you now. But above all, we would praise you this morning that you can change sinners into saints. We can hardly imagine what we shall feel like when we are perfect, when we are exactly like the Lord Jesus, and feel as he feels, and see as he sees. But Father, we thank you that you've already begun to make that glorious change. We thank you that there are desires in our hearts that once we never had, that there are thoughts in our minds that we could never have discovered by the powers of human reason, that there are experiences we have, moving experiences of your love which we never thought possible. Father, we praise you that no one in this service need be lonely, that no one need be afraid, that no one need feel guilty, that your forgiveness awaits. So, Lord, make this service a service that helps to change us, that brings us that much nearer to our Lord and Savior, for we ask it in his name and for his sake. Amen. Let us turn to the Word of God. We're reading and studying 2 Corinthians just now. And we're going to start reading this morning at chapter 6, verse 2. Chapter 6, verse 2 of Paul's second letter to the Corinthians. If you haven't got a Bible and would like one, just raise your hand and one of the stewards will bring one straight away. 2 Corinthians, chapter 6, verse 3. Sounds as if we're going to have a little interruption from those who are making straight the highway outside, but I hope that will not distract you. Verse 3 of chapter 6. We put no obstacle in anyone's way, so that no fault may be found with our ministry, but as servants of God we commend ourselves in every way. Through great endurance in afflictions, hardships, calamities, beatings, imprisonments, tumults, labors, watchings, hunger. By purity, knowledge, forbearance, kindness, the Holy Spirit, genuine love, truthful speech, and the power of God. With the weapon of righteousness for the right hand and for the left, in honor and dishonor, in ill repute and good repute. We are treated as impostors and yet are true, as unknown and yet well known, as dying and behold we live, as punished and yet not killed, as sorrowful yet always rejoicing, as poor yet making many rich, as having nothing and yet possessing everything. Our mouth is wide open to you, Corinthians. Our heart is wide. You are not restricted by us, but you are restricted in your own affections, 
in return I speak as to children, widen your hearts also. Now I'm going to jump from there to chapter 7 verse 2. Not because I think that little bit is out of place in between. I want to deal with that tonight as a separate subject. And the appeal in verse 13 that we've just read flows straight on into chapter 7 verse 2. Open your hearts to us. We have wronged no one. We have corrupted no one. We have taken advantage of no one. I do not say this to condemn you, for I said before that you are in our hearts to die together and to live together. I have great confidence in you. I have great pride in you. I am filled with comfort. With all our affliction, I am overjoyed. For even when we came into Macedonia, our bodies had no rest. We were afflicted at every turn, fighting without and fears within. But God who comforts the downcast comforted us by the coming of Titus. And not only by his coming, but also by the comfort with which he was comforted in you as he told us of your longing, your mourning, your zeal for me so that I rejoice still more. For even if I made you sorry with my letter, I do not regret it, though I did regret it. For I see that that letter grieved you, though only for a while. As it is, I rejoice, not because you were grieved, but because you were grieved into repenting. For you felt a godly grief, so that you suffered no loss through us. For godly grief produces a repentance that leads to salvation and brings no regret. But worldly grief produces death. For see what earnestness this godly grief has produced in you. What eagerness to clear yourselves. What indignation. What alarm. What longing. What zeal. What punishment. At every point you have proved yourselves guiltless in this matter. So although I wrote to you, it was not on account of the one who did the wrong, nor on account of the one who suffered the wrong, but in order that your zeal for us might be revealed to you in the sight of God. Therefore we are comforted. And besides our own comfort, we rejoice still more at the joy of Titus because his mind has been set at rest by you all. For if I have expressed to him some pride in you, I was not put to shame. But just as everything we said to you was true, everything so our boasting before Titus has proved true. And his heart goes out all the more to you as he remembers the obedience of you all and the fear and the trembling with which you received him. I rejoice because I have perfect confidence in you. One of the false cults that is gaining many new adherents today is the cult of the easy life. The cult of the easy life. You can see it on the advertising hoardings. You can see it in the gambling fever. And I heard only yesterday of a man who is just no good as a worker who's won a fortune on the pools and who's walking around in this superb clothes with an expensive camera. He's found the easy life that way. You can see it in the constant demand for shorter working hours and more money for those shorter working hours. You can see it in the increasing emphasis on creaturely comforts, in furniture design, in so much. The cult of the easy life is a cult that is rapidly developing today. And if you want the easy life, then I beg of you not to follow Jesus, because he has nothing to do with that false cult. He didn't live an easy, comfortable life himself, nor did he ever promise that a disciple of his would find that life would be easy, smooth, and comfortable and safe. Indeed, he promised exactly the opposite. He said, in this world, you will have trouble, big trouble. Nor did he ever say that there would come a point in your Christian life where you could say, I've done my bit, I'm going to retire now and leave it to the younger folk. I'm going to take it easy. I've fought the good fight all these years and I'm just going to ease up now. There is no discharge in that war. Not until we are dead will we be released 
from the battle that the Christian life presents. Now, the passage that I've read underlines very clearly that Paul had been called by Christ not to a picnic but to a battle, not to a bed of roses but to a crown of thorns. And there are two areas in which he experienced real trouble and tension in the Christian life. And these are the two areas in which you will too. One is the world and the other is the church. Now this may be a surprise to you. It comes as a surprise to some people that the world makes it difficult for Christians. Those who have a naive view of human nature and believe that everybody in the world is basically good and that everybody really, if told the truth, would respond to it and that everybody really wants to love God, those who have that naive understanding have never really exercised a ministry of the gospel in the world. But when you do, you'll find it's tough. You'll find that people are not basically by nature good. They are not eager for the truth. They are not wanting to love God. And those who go to them with the truth will be called impostors and hypocrites. And those who go to share with them the riches of the world will be treated as those who are beggars. And this is part of the battle that comes. Those of us who know what our own nature is really like and therefore what other people's nature is really like are not surprised that it's tough to be a Christian in the world. But what does come as a surprise, maybe to you as a Christian, will be the discovery that Paul found it tough to be a Christian inside the church. Let me say, for example, straight away, that if you ask any missionary, they will tell you that one of the greatest problems of being a missionary is that of relationships with other missionaries. And indeed it is this second area in which Paul found most of his deepest sorrows, his deepest emotions and his deepest griefs and burdens came to him not through the world's antagonism, but through the church. And we are going to look at these two areas in which you will find the Christian life tough. It will be tough in the world, it will be tough in the church. But that doesn't mean that it's not a life that isn't full of joy and victory and triumph. But it'll be a battle in both places. Now let's look utterly frankly and honestly as Paul does at these two areas of battle and how they contribute to this tough side of the Christian life. Now before describing the troubles that his Christianity had got into, he makes an incredible claim which quite frankly I could not make. He says this, I am in no way responsible for the troubles that I have suffered. I've never brought these on myself. I have put no obstacle in people's way. There is no fault in my ministry that others could use to blame for the troubles that I've seen. Now that's an incredible claim. As I've said, I couldn't make it. But he did. And he said, look at my ministry. We commend ourselves in every way. The troubles we've seen are due to what we've said, not what we are. And herein lies a very important principle. And it is this. When we suffer as Christians, when we run into trouble, the first question must always be, have I caused this? Or has the message caused this? It is vital that we should come to the right answer. If I have caused it, then something must be put right. If the message has caused it, then I have to face the battle and leave it there. Now Paul says, we have put no obstacle. There is no fault in our ministry. And yet, in spite of that, trouble, trouble, trouble. He just ran out of one trouble into another. We're going to look first of all at the troubles he ran into in the world. And he first makes the claim that he is utterly reliable as a minister of the gospel. No matter what discouragements, what troubles he goes into, he goes on. No matter how often he's knocked down, he gets up again and goes on. He's utterly reliable in all the troubles. Now look at the list, through thick and thin. It's an incredible list. Afflictions, 
hardships, calamities, beatings, imprisonments, tumults, labors, watching, hunger. That's a very interesting list. It includes things that I've never known in the service of Christ, and I dare say you've not known them either. What a life! The day that Paul met Jesus, that day he was committed to a life like this. He had not suffered before. He'd had a career. He'd gone to the top of that career. If there'd been any suffering in connection with Paul, it was the suffering that he caused other people. But he'd not suffered himself. But the day he met Jesus, one thing that Jesus told him was this. I am going to tell you now how many things you must suffer in my name. Now that is an honesty which can be conspicuous by its absence from our evangelism today. If we preach in such a way that we say, come to Jesus and all your troubles are over, come to Jesus and life's going to be lovely and smooth and happy all day, come to Jesus and, and life is just one glorious experience and a testimony can give that impression very clearly. Do you remember Dr. Bob Frost talking to us about how to give your testimony? He said, the Christian life is like this on the graph, mountain tops and valley bottoms. And then somebody asks us to give our testimony, so we draw a line mentally just below the top of those peaks. And we string together all the things that are cut off by the line above the line. And then we give our testimony. And people get the impression life has just been wonderfully smooth and beautifully sweet ever since we came to know Jesus. That's not honest. And when Dr. Frost was asked to give his testimony in the cathedral, he mentally did that. He drew the line, he put it all together, and he asked the Lord to help him to make a real impression in the cathedral. And the Lord said, whatever do you want to do that for? And he said, well, I want to help these people to, to know you and love you. And the Lord said, well, that's not the way to do it. And Bob Frost said to the Lord, well, what do you want me to do? And the Lord said, I just want you to be honest. And he said, but that's not the place for that. <laughs> most delightful remark but Paul is honest and Jesus was honest and the day that Paul came to Jesus Jesus said you're going to suffer an awful lot you're really going to go through it how many things you must suffer it's there in Acts 9:16 if you want to look it up and Paul knew from the first day of his Christian life it was going to be tough very tough he went into it with open eyes. He knew that it was going to be a greater battle than he'd ever known in his life. And I think if we're absolutely honest, our testimony ought to be that every one of us who's come to know Christ has had more trouble since we came to know Jesus than we had before. But we face that trouble with Jesus, and that's the difference. The troubles have been greater, but the victory's been greater, and therefore the joy has been deeper. This is an honest approach to the Christian life. So Paul knew all about these things before he experienced them, but that doesn't make it any easier to bear. And when I look through this list, I notice a number of things about them. First of all, I notice that most of them are physical suffering, strain of the body. He found himself time and again worn out. The little word watching, do you know what that literally means? I, I would prefer to translate it, insomnia. Have you ever spent a sleepless night over the work of the Lord? Do you know what that, that is? To lie awake at night wondering how the work of the Lord can go forward? What's going wrong with it? That's what's meant by watchings. Doing without meals, hunger, it's nearly all physically something that the body had to suffer. And we are living in the flesh. We're in bodies. And there is a physical strain in the Christian life. A toughness is needed physically. And Paul was not very strong physically. We know this from various descriptions of him. We have from outside the Bible as well as inside. He is described as a little man of poor physique, bow-legged, bald, and looking as if he could just be knocked over with a feather. That was his physical appearance. And we have that description of him. He, he says in a letter in the New Testament, my physical appearance is not very impressive. I know that. He was a poor little thing. And this little man 
was put through this kind of strain, found himself in the middle of public riots. He lived in the Northern Irish situation the whole time. Wherever, wherever he went, there seemed to be a riot. And he found himself carried and dragged by the crowds and stoned and left for dead outside the city. Time and again, beaten with rods, whipped, put in prison in chains. This poor little man had to go through that. And I notice this, that all this didn't break his reliability. He commended himself in much endurance. A man who can get up and go on. A man who doesn't do one of two things that would be very human. If Paul had done one of these two things, I'd have understood him. So would you. First, a man who didn't retire early. He could have said, look, I've done my bit. In the last ten years, I've really been through it. I'm going to leave stronger, younger men to go on with the gospel now. But he never did. I have fought the good fight. I've kept the faith. I've finished the course. I've got there. That's what he said just before he died. A man who's utterly reliable, no matter what physical strain he goes through. That's a man who's a minister of the gospel. The other thing that human nature would do, some human natures would say, I give up. I retire. I've just about had enough. But the other human reaction is to retaliate. It is human in us to hit back when we are knocked down to knock someone else down when we are under strain to pass that strain back to those who put us under it, when we are hit to hit back, did Paul retaliate? Let's turn now to look at the weapons of his defense. How did Paul fight this thing? It is a sad reflection on human nature that battles usually tend to make us use the same weapons that the enemy has used first. A simple illustration of this would be the Second World War. Do you remember when the Germans first blitzed London and Coventry? The outcry of correspondence in British newspapers at this inhuman, barbaric, cruel approach. Those letter writers were strangely silent two and three years later when we sent a thousand bombers to blast a German city off the map. And it was the Allies, not the Axis, who first wiped out two Japanese cities. And by the end of the war, we were doing things to the enemy for which we'd condemned the enemy at the beginning of the war. Battles tend to have this effect on human nature, to give as good as you get. How did Paul defend himself? What weapons did he have in his right hand and in his left in this battle? He tells us now. The Christian approach to a battle is this. The best way to obtain victory is to fight with opposites. You will never overcome evil with evil. You can only overcome evil with good. And Paul chose out of the armory of God everything that was the opposite of that which made people attack him. He was attacked because he went into a world of impurity. So he defended himself with purity. He was attacked because he preached in a world of ignorance, so he defended himself with knowledge. He was attacked because he lived in an impatient world, and so he defended himself with forbearance. He was attacked because of unkind people, so he defended himself with kindness. He was attacked because evil spirits possessed men, so he defended himself by the Holy Spirit. He was attacked because people hated him, so he defended himself with genuine love. He was attacked by slander and by false accusation, so he defended himself with true speech. He was attacked by the power of men, so he defended himself by the power of God. What a statement that is. Here is the way to fight the battle. When you're being pressed on all sides, fight with opposites. Choose the very opposite of that which is attacking you to defend. And these are the weapons for the right hand and the left. Now in a battle, in a personal warfare, the right hand is used for attack and the left hand is used for defense. Not quite sure about boxing here, but I'm sure about warfare and Roman warfare. This was the hand for the spear or the sword. This was the hand for the shield. And Paul is saying, 
in this battle, whether attacking or defending, use the weapon that is the opposite that is being used against you. In other words, the best weapon of all in the battles of life is sheer goodness, righteousness, sheer goodness. A saint is invincible. You can't win a battle against sheer goodness. You may throw at a saint all that you've got, and yet that saint can't be beaten. This is the weapon to use. And Paul says, I'm attacked on every side, but these are my weapons, sheer goodness, to defeat the evil. But we must now go on to realize that the world does not recognize sheer goodness. A man who's a saint walking through this world will not find everybody saying, what a saint. The reputation of a saint will vary tremendously. A saint will make enemies as well as friends. Beware of universal popularity. Jesus said, woe unto you when all men speak well of you. He knew this from hard experience. Jesus had a way of leaving people infuriated or infatuated. They either thought highly of him and, and said they loved him with everything they'd got and they'd drop everything, fishing included, and follow him, or else they immediately began to plot and to hate him. He left enemies and friends instantly. He divided people down the middle. You couldn't be neutral in relation to Jesus. And a saint who walks with Jesus will find the same thing. John Bunyan, who lived in a cottage along the Millbrook there, wrote his autobiography, and he called it Grace Abounding. And underneath the title, he wrote this text. All who would live a godly life in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. If you really want to be a saint, expect misunderstanding. Your reputation will be thrown around from one extreme to the other in ill repute and good repute. You'll find both. Some people will think the world of you and some people will think just the opposite. The one thing a Christian needs to be free from is any desire to have a reputation. How will the world treat us? in the opposite way usually to that which is really deserved. Treated as impostors, we are true. People will say, they must be a hypocrite, they must be in it for something else. What do they get out of it all? What does Billy Graham make on his visits to England? This is what the world will say. He's an imposter, yet he's true. He's come for no other reason than to help people when he comes to Britain. And yet people will say he's in it for the money or in it for the glory, that he's an imposter, that he's a quack. The world will treat us as imposters, yet we're true. The world will treat us as unknown. Who are these people? They're nobodies, no reputation, and yet in God's sight, well known, well known. Here was Paul, this little Jew, wandering around the Roman Empire. The Roman emperor at this stage had no idea that he existed. The public world had little knowledge of Paul. He was just a traveling preacher. And yet Paul is now one of the most famous people in the world. As unknown, yet well known. Look at the next contrast. As dying, and behold we live. Whenever they looked at Paul, they said, there's a dying man, he's finished. I give him a few more months. Look at him. And yet Paul says, behold we live. The world will treat people as punished as criminals, as those who ought to be cast out of society, as those who disturb and upset. And yet, says Paul, they can't kill us. As sad people, it's amazing how many people in the world think that if you become a Christian, you'll become miserable. And to them, we are miserable. You put a Christian in the middle of a cocktail party and <laughs> see how happy he looks. <laughs> to the world, we are miserable. They can't share the joy, and we can't laugh at their jokes. We're miseries, we're wet blankets, and yet always rejoicing. And the world says, you're poor, poor. They say, look at your resources. Look at you, you're poor people. You're not big, powerful, mighty, rich empire. You're poor. Yes, they were mostly slaves in those days, and yet... 
You've got enough wealth to make another a millionaire, making many rich. You can give people the earth. There was Mr. Paul Getty looking so miserable this week because he's failed to buy a little bit of sand underneath the North Sea. Did you see the photograph? All his millions couldn't buy the little bit of land under, at the bottom of the ocean. I can give people the earth, for the meek shall inherit the earth. By the grace of God, I could preach a gospel that could make somebody a joint heir with Christ, as poor and yet making all rich. And that lovely final contrast, the world will say, you've got nothing that I want. You've got nothing to offer me. The world says, you've got nothing. And yet, possessing all things, and the word possessing means possessing things that you will never have to let go. You've really got them forever, possessing all things. Well, now that's the ministry that Paul exercised. It was tough. The world opposed, the world misunderstood, the world attacked. But he used the weapon of sheer goodness to win the battle. And he said, I don't care what you think of me. The real situation is that I'm true. I'm rich. I'm rejoicing. You may think I'm a miserable wet blanket, but I rejoice. You may think I've nothing to give you, but I've got everything to give you. You may think I'm poor, but I can make you a millionaire. And it is this reliability of ministry and much endurance that can go on facing a world like that that really wins through in the end. Now, why does Paul talk about all this? Why does he lay bare his heart? Why does he say, look into my heart, see how I feel? Why is he being so frank about the troubles he's been through? I'll tell you why. Because his greatest burden was not the response of people in the world to him, but the response of people in the church to him. There was reserve. He could put up with antagonism in the world, but suspicion in the church, no, that was hard. And so he's told all this to the Corinthians because he says, look, my mouth is wide open. I'm talking about myself. I'm sharing my innermost feelings with you. Why? Because I want you to open your heart to me. Even if I don't have many friends in the world, I want you to be my friends. You see, Christians need affection and love, and they're not going to get it in the world. They need it so badly. Where can they find it? The answer is they've got to get it in the fellowship of the church. And if you don't find it there, that's a great burden. What a sorrow. You can face anything in the world if you can get among Christians and find affection and love flowing because our hearts cry out for affection. Nobody likes going through all these troubles. Nobody likes being disliked and misunderstood in the world. The only thing that can keep you going in that is the fellowship of Christians who love you. You see, this is a human thing we can't just survive with the love of God. I don't want to be irreverent here. But the love of God is mediated to us through the love of Christians. And if you feel that no Christians love you either, then you just can't face the battle outside. We are human, and God wants us to have human love. Otherwise, what happens is that all the troubles in the world makes us hard, bitter. We become a kind of self-imposed martyr and we get hard and we lose affection. Paul says, look, there's no reserve on my side, no barrier on my side. I would go through earth, air, fire and water for you. Just open your hearts to me. Let's love each other. Let's get rid of the restricted affections. You see, a group of Christians who are reserved and shy and withdrawn is a contradiction in terms. He said, don't receive the grace of the Lord in vain. That's at the beginning of the chapter. If you can receive the grace of God and remain closed in your heart and restricted in your affections, you've received it in vain, emptily. The grace of God is meant to liberate our feelings, our affections, open our hearts. I've opened my mouth, says Paul, because my heart is wide. I want you to get my feelings because I want to have yours. So let's have this mutual unrestricted affection. He hasn't told them all this to get their sympathy. Paul is a man in whom I can never find any trace of self-pity. He's not telling them about his feelings to get his sympathy, but to get their affection. 
so that they may love him as he goes through this battle. So we move on to the second great difficulty of the Christian life, and that is relating to other Christians in warm affection. Not respectable relations, but warm affection, so that there's a flow of love, so that it goes from one to the other. Now this is particularly poignant here, because Paul is talking to those who are his own children. There is something horrible about a family in which the children have no affection for parents. It is my privilege to go into so many homes. And I don't think anything moves me so much in a home as seeing a home in which children spontaneously show affection for their parents. And just love their parents. And is there anything more tragic than to go into a home where the children don't have affection? don't have love. And Paul says, I speak to you as my children. I brought you into the world. I led you to the Lord. You're my children. And yet I feel that you're not giving me the affection that the parents should have. There's no barrier on my side. But there seems to be a barrier on yours. And so he plunges into this, this difficulty. Now, as I've said, I've left aside verses 14 to 7, verse 1. I want to deal with the question of separation tonight. It fits because Paul is saying, widen your affections, widen your hearts, but he's going to say there are limits to what your heart should do. Your affections must not be unlimited. Your heart must never rule your head. Widen your affections to believers. But be careful about relationships with unbelievers. But I'll say more about that tonight. Back to verse 2 of chapter 7. A little history will help here, I think. Paul had led a group of Corinthians to Christ, started a church, and left them to it. And then he heard that things were going badly wrong. There were cliques in the church. They were openly allowing sin in the church. Men were getting drunk at the Lord's table. Women were behaving in a way unfitting to their sex. Speaking in tongues had got out of hand and was turning services into bedlam. Members were doubting the physical resurrection of Jesus. And he was so unhappy, so he wrote a letter to them, which we call 1 Corinthians. And that letter didn't put it right. So he went to them. And he spoke to them to their faces, and it was a painful visit. And he came away very, very sad. They had opposed him to his face. They told him not to meddle in the church. They told him they no longer recognized his authority over them. He'd had a rough time at the hands of his own converts. Is anything sadder than that? Someone you've led to the Lord turning round and treating you like this. Very sad. And these are Christians, remember. And Paul came away from that painful visit. And wherever he went to preach, he couldn't get on with the preaching. He said, my heart was heavy. I had no rest. I had to keep moving. And finally he said to his friend Titus, Titus, I believe that deep down underneath those Corinthian Christians are all right. I believe that they will come through this. I have confidence in them, but I'm so anxious about them, they won't welcome me again. Will you go and see them for me? Will you go and visit them? I'm confident they'll come through it, but I'm so anxious. And so Paul sent Titus. And he said, Titus, there's no barrier on my side. I've never wronged any of them. I've never corrupted any of them. I've never exploited any of them. And he said, they're inside my heart. I don't have to open my heart to them. They're in my heart. We live together and we die together. They're in my heart. I don't have to open my heart to someone. If I shut my heart, I'd shut them inside it. And my heart is bursting with them with confidence and pride and comfort and joy. You see, Paul had a heart that locked people inside it. But he said, I'm not in their hearts at the moment. They're in my heart, but I'm not in theirs. And that's something that shouldn't be among Christians. Titus, go and see. And Titus came back. And he said, Paul, it's all right now. It's all right. 
They were hurt. They were offended. They were grieved by what you said. But it's all right now. They've put it right. And they think the world of you, Paul. They're longing to see you. They're zealous for you. And can you imagine Paul's heart? He said, it's bursting. It's bursting. It was full before, but now it's bursting. May I just say this to summarize what I'm trying to say here. I don't think there is any sorrow known to Christians that is so deep as the sorrow of lack of affection in the fellowship. And therefore there is no joy so deep at the human level known to Christians as the joy of unreserved fellowship. The Christian life is a life of deep emotion, deep feelings, feelings that go rock bottom. And the deepest grief you have as a Christian will be caused by fellow Christians. But likewise, that means that when that is healed, the deepest joy you'll ever find is the joy of restored fellowship. Here then are the heights and depths of Christian emotion. And we get all of them here. And Paul says, yes, I was depressed, I was down. I realized that my visit, my words to you, my letter had hurt. And when I found that they'd hurt, I regretted it. But just momentarily, now I know that the grief that was caused was God's way of bringing us all closer to himself. There are two sorts of unhappiness. There is a worldly unhappiness that leads to death. And there is a divine unhappiness that leads to repentance and reconciliation. And these two sorts of happiness are totally unhappiness are totally different. Let me just draw that out. First of all, what is worldly sorrow? Worldly sorrow has regrets, remorse, and even resentment, but no repentance, no change. It leads to either despair or defiance, but both kill. They kill love, they kill relationship. And despair and defiance are the products of worldly grief. Someone has said that every sinner will be sorry one day. Every sinner. But their sorrow will not lead to salvation. What is worldly sorrow for sin? I'll tell you, it's either sorry for being found out. The sorrow over exposure. Or it's the sorrow over consequences. Hell is going to be a very, very sad place. Everybody in hell will be sorry that they've sinned. There will be weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. But all of that sorrow will not lead to salvation. Because it's worldly sorrow. It's being sorry about the consequences. It's being sad about what the sin has led to. The godly sorrow that Paul mentions is the sorrow about the thing that was wrong. Just the sheer sorrow that something was not in God's plan or in his will. And that kind of sorrow leads to a change. Again, there's a common misunderstanding that repentance is feeling sorry. Do you notice that it is the sorrow that leads to repentance? It isn't repentance in itself, but godly sorrow produces repentance, which is a change of outlook, of behavior, of attitude. And it is that which brings salvation. And Paul says, I wrote to you and I said certain things to you which hurt. And I regretted hurting you at the time. But he said, now I know that it was God's way of producing a sorrow that led to a change of heart and a change of attitude and a change of mind to repentance. And so, and this is the most paradoxical statement in this, in this letter, your mourning means that I rejoice the more. Your mourning means that I rejoice the more. What an incredible statement. I'm happy because you're unhappy. He's happy because they were unhappy in a way that led them to God. It is part of his ministry. He was in a sense their pastor and not their pet lamb. And therefore from time to time what he said hurt. But it was God's way of bringing them 
into his perfect will. And their mourning made him rejoice the more. Because it was soon over. It had no regrets. They lost nothing. And it was soon over. And that's godly grief. Worldly grief is exactly the opposite. It's full of regret. And you do lose a lot. And it's not soon over. It goes on smoldering in the heart. But godly grief, no. That's something that's over quickly. And it has no regrets. And you are not the loser. Praise God for godly grief. There's a place for sorrow that leads us nearer to God. And therefore nearer to one another. And finally he says, you know, Titus told me a wonderful thing. Titus came back and said to me, Paul, everything you said about the Corinthians is true. You said they'd come through it. You said you believed in them. You said you had confidence in them. Well, you're right. They've come through it. And they've just captured my heart. What a lovely church. What a fellowship. And Paul finishes by saying, I have perfect confidence in you. That's what makes for unrestricted affection. That's what makes for the joy of the Lord. Unrestricted affection is due to perfect confidence. Everything that destroys confidence destroys affection. If you wrong someone, if you corrupt someone, if you exploit someone, they can't trust you anymore and therefore your heart closes. But when you've got confidence in them, your heart opens and the affection flows. Here then is Paul's tough Christian life. Let me finish by saying this. Love is a warm thing as hatred is a cold thing. And I understand from my lessons in physics when I was a schoolboy that heat expands. And therefore, if a heart is filled with love, then it's going to get bigger. And Paul says, widen your hearts. Let them warm up and expand a bit. So let me finish by saying two things. A Christian can't live without emotions. Let us say straight away that to give the impression that the Christian life must get rid of feelings is utterly wrong. That's a belief called Stoicism, not Christianity. Christianity is a, a life of deep feeling. It's not a purely intellectual thing. It's an emotional life. And as a Christian, you'll know mountaintops of great happiness and you'll know very deep, dark valleys of depression. Yes, you'll know this. Not because of self-pity. That kind of depression has no place in the Christian life. But the kind of depression that comes from concern for other people. And that concern will carry you down to the depths of sleeplessness. But when it's put right, you'll be on the mountaintop of joy. You'll say, my heart's bursting again. No sorrow like the division of Christians and no joy like the coming together again. So we can't live without emotions. Intense joy and deep unhappiness are the lot of every Christian. But let me add that you can't live by your emotions. How fatal to link your faith to your feelings in such a way that your faith goes up and down. Let your feelings go up and down, they will. But let your faith be constant and let it grow. And it is this rightful relationship between faith and feeling that enabled Paul to be a faithful minister of the gospel. His feelings in the church and the world went up and down like that. But his faith remained absolutely firm. And it was this that held him. So let's not be ashamed of emotion. Let's not be reserved. Let's not let sorrow dictate what this fellowship should be like. Let's widen our hearts to each other, open them, trust each other, and let the affection flow as befits brothers and sisters in a family who are going to live together in heaven. Let us pray. Father, if we are restricted in our affections, if we have barriers in our hearts, we earnestly pray that by your Spirit you will remove them. That the affection 
within the fellowship may enable us to face any opposition we have outside, may keep us going when it seems we are all alone. The remembrance that not only do you love us, but your people love us. Grant that this may be our strength and stay. And grant that in the battles we shall all have to fight this week, the one weapon we use may be the weapon of sheer goodness, that we may overcome evil with good. Father, your word is very sharp. It cuts very deep. But we thank you that it can be a surgeon's knife, healing, cutting out what is wrong. So, Lord, be with us. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.